Good morning, friends. It's Drayton. Welcome to my world. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, again today. We're going to go on a very cool adventure. But first, coffee. I like that the streets have the names on the sidewalk here. These brass plates. It's cool. Checking this place out. I found it on Yelp. It looks like a house. It blends right in. Just didn't see it. There's some really small place. It's like a living room of somebody's house. prestigious property as it should be. We have made it to Drayton Hall. I've heard about this place when I was in elementary school. I thought it was so cool that there was a place with my very unique name. I've learned about some history over time and as I've been passing by on road trips through life, I have always wanted to stop here. And today is the day. Here we are. Thanks for joining me. Here we are, the visitor center for Drayton Hall. This place is really nice. The visitor center is cool. Just a really nice place. I'm interested to know the story of this and very little about it. This will be good. It's an hour long tour. My name is Shannon. I'm originally from Clemson, South Carolina. So go Tigers. If you're a football fan. <laughs> um, I want to get started by uh, going over a little housekeeping. Drayton designed and built Drayton Hall. He was the third son of Anne Fox Drayton and Thomas Drayton, who lived next door at the Magnolia Plantation. But being the third son in that family, he knew he wasn't going to inherit anything over at Magnolia. So his mother set aside a little money for John just to kind of get him started in life. And at age 23, he takes that money and he buys 350 acres next door to Magnolia Plantation. And that's where he builds Drayton Hall. Over the course of John's life, he's going to amass a plantation empire consisting of 76,000 acres across the colony of South Carolina. Most of those properties are located here in the Low Country area where he's mainly growing rice. That was the biggest cash crop in this area. And up until the time of the Civil War, Charleston or the Low Country area was second in the world in rice production. The only place that produced more rice than this area right here was the country of China. Our rice was so valuable, it was called Carolina gold because it was literally worth its weight in gold. And it's rice that made Charles one of the richest planters in the 13 colonies. Now, we can think of Drayton as the business center for that plantation empire. This was never a commercial plantation itself. They were growing things here, they were raising livestock as well, but it was mainly to feed the family that was living here as well as the 40 to 45 enslaved uh, Africans here on the property. Now we know that John Drayton had far more than 45 enslaved Africans and African Americans. With 76,000 acres worth of plantation properties, it was well up into the hundreds, if not thousands of enslaved people that he owned, but we don't know the exact number. Now the enslaved Africans and African Americans who were living here at Drayton Hall, um, some of them were living in the house as we'll discuss, but uh, the vast majority of them were living in a settlement that was located somewhere near the African American Cemetery. If you saw the signs for that as you drove into the property today, 
We're not sure of the exact location, but we know that it was somewhere in that area. Now, John Drayton married four times over the course of his life. His first wife he marries in 1737. Her name was Sarah Cattell. She was the daughter of a neighboring plantation owner. Now, they had two sons together, but by 1740, Sarah, as well as both sons, had died. And so John marries for a second time in 1741. His second wife was Charlotta Bull. Now, Charlotta's father was the lieutenant governor here, so this was a very high-profile political marriage for John. They had two sons as well, William Henry and Charles, but Charlotta dies not long after Charles's birth. So John marries for a third time in 1752. This time he marries Margaret Glenn. Margaret was originally from Scotland, but her brother was the royal governor here. And so again, this is another very uh, high profile marriage for John. They had three children, including two sons, but Margaret hated it here. She found it far too hot and humid in the summertime, go figure. <laughs> and so when her sons were old enough to go to England for their education, she goes back with them and she never returns. Now they stay married the whole time that Margaret is back in England and she dies in 1772 after an illness. So John marries for the fourth and final time in 1775. Um, this time he marries uh, Rebecca Perry, who was a, another daughter of a neighboring plantation owner. And at the time of their marriage, Rebecca was 17 years old and John Drayton was 60. A wee bit of an age difference there, everybody guesses. Now, they still had three children together, Anna, Susanna, and John, but just four years after their marriage, it's 1779. The British are amassing troops over here on this side of the Ashley River. They're planning the siege of Charleston. They're going to succeed in taking over the city in 1780. Now, the British decide to use Drayton Hall as their headquarters while they plan the siege, but the Drayton family themselves were patriots, and so they evacuate the property. And as the family is making their way over towards Mount Pleasant, John Drayton suffers from some kind of fatal seizure, and he is buried somewhere along the Ashley River. We're not sure where his final resting place is, but his widow, Rebecca, she never remarries after John's death. And because of that, she's allowed to continue owning and maintaining property, and she inherits everything from John. In 1784, she sells it all to Charles Drayton, who at the time, was John's eldest surviving son from that second marriage to Charlotta. And it's from Charles's time here that we know the most about this place. He left behind very detailed plantation diaries telling us the ins and outs of how he ran these properties. We know the names and occupations of many of the uh, enslaved people here, so we'll be talking a lot about them when we get into the house today. But overall, seven generations of Draytons have uh, owned this property and in 1974, the seventh generation owners, Frank and Charlie Drayton, made a very difficult decision. They decided to sell Drayton Hall and the property to the National Trust for Historic Preservation because they knew they didn't have the funds themselves to, to continue maintaining the, the home and they didn't want it to be lost forever. They knew the National Trust would continue to maintain it, preserve it, and make it available to the public. So we've been a National Trust property since then. And in 2015, the Drayton Hall Preservation Trust was organized, and we manage all of the day-to-day -day operations out here at the site. Now, I realize that I've just thrown a lot of names and dates at you. I promise the entire tour is not going to be like that. But before we head up to the house, do we have any questions? <laughs> This is really cool. So, so John is what we would consider a gentleman architect. He is designing a house but has no formal training in architecture. And so people like John, these wealthy gentlemen, often look to the past for inspiration in designing their homes. And John looks to the 16th century Italian architect Andrea Palladio. Now the hallmarks of Palladian style are balance and proportion. It's a very symmetrical architectural style. If we were to cut this house right down the middle, the right and left halves would pretty much be mirror images of each other. But it's the portico that is truly special about this house. It does three things all at the same time. It recedes into the house, 
it projects outward from the house and it has stacked columns. There is no structure anywhere else in the world that does all three of those things at the same time. You'll get two out of three, but not all three. So this is really a one of a kind building. There's no video allowed inside Drayton Hall, so we'll continue with audio and photos only until we exit the house. I'll see you at the end of the tour. There's our house friends. We'll see what's called egg and dart molding. Now we'll see it around the perimeter of the ceiling, but we can also see it in greater detail, a bit more close up here in various places on the fireplace. It's this U shape with the egg shape in the center. That particular motif designates a room as a public space as opposed to more of a family only space. And again, we're gonna see this in some rooms and not in others depending on how the family is using those rooms. Now while we're looking at the mantel here, this is a gorgeous example of a Georgian style mantle and over mantle. And in fact, this particular design with just a few changes comes almost exactly from a design book that was uh, famous and, and, and uh, very popular amongst the English gentry. The book was called The Designs of Inigo Jones. It was published in 1727 by William Kent. And the fact that John Drayton is using design books like that to help design his own home tells us that he's very concerned with keeping on the cutting edge of what's popular in England all the way over here in Charleston, South Carolina. And he wants everyone coming into his house to recognize that right off the bat. Now, the blue-gray paint that we find on the walls dates to the 1880s. It is the third coat of paint that was applied to these walls. And we, we know the original color that John Drayton used. Um, he would call it yellow ochre. Today we might call it tan. It's very similar to the color of the carpets that you're going to see on the floors uh, in all of these rooms. I'll show you some evidence of that original paint as we move through the house. Now, at this, around the time that the blue-gray paint was added to the walls, we also see these porcelain picture knobs being added. And in some places, we can even see ghost marks from where pieces of art or mirrors were once hanging on the walls. But I think my favorite part of this room is above our heads. It's the ceiling. Now, this is a beautiful example of a cast plaster ceiling. It dates to about the 1830s, 1840s. And it is the third ceiling to be installed in this room. The first two were hand carved plaster and they were both most likely damaged from motion coming from the floor above us. We'll talk a little bit about why that happened when we get upstairs. But when I say this is a cast plaster ceiling, I mean that all of these decorative elements were made by pouring wet plaster into molds and once that dried, all of those pieces were adhered to the ceiling using additional wet plaster, kind of like a glue. Any questions while we're in here? Who were the, who would the builders? Thing, the actual bricklayers and carpenters. And sure, houses. sure. So primarily enslaved labor. So we know that John used um, uh, a majority of enslaved laborers to build this house. He did hire some European artisans to uh, to assist. But but make no mistake, the the enslaved laborers that were helping to build this house or that were building this house were very kind of skilled in their own right. Then have learned from and apprenticed under European artisans themselves. And so we don't know precisely who did what in terms of the individual carvings and plaster work, etc., but we do know that it was largely in place. Yes, sir. All right. Well, everyone, if you were coming to Drayton Hall to be entertained, your next stop would quite likely be the drawing room. So that's where we're going to head next, right through this doorway <coughs> here in the corner. So we're in a smaller room, but we're in a more formal room because we have already graduated to our ionic capitals here on our pilasters. We also have these beautiful hand-carved mahogany slags 
above each of the windows. Now that mahogany is another one of the imported materials John's using. And it's probably coming from somewhere in the Caribbean or down in South America, but that's a really expensive decorative detail. Now again, my favorite thing about this room is the ceiling. Now in this case, this is a hand carved plaster ceiling. It is original to the 1738 house. And every time I come in here, I just imagine being the artist who's designing this. He's got scaffolding built in this room. He's lying on his back, carving this design by hand out of the wet plaster. It is truly a work of art. And for that reason, we do not go into the room directly above it. We don't want any motion from the floor damaging this beautiful ceiling. But I'll tell you, the biggest thing that people want to know about when they come in this room is right over there. What is that all about? Well, remember, the hallmark of Palladian style is balance and proportion. We can't have a door here without having a door there to balance the room. But that is a load-bearing wall. We don't want to open that up. But what John Drayton does is he puts a fancy door there that would remain permanently closed, and its sole function was to balance out the room. Now, at some point, that door is taken down. We don't know when or by whom. We do know that after about 1860, the Draytons did not use this house as their primary residence. They were only out here for a few weeks in the fall and spring, and for the remainder of the year, this home was pretty much uh, empty. It was, it was unoccupied, and from time to time, vandals got in and they messed around inside the house. It's possible vandals took that door down wanting to see what was behind it, and they got really disappointed. <laughs> But we don't know. It could have been the drains. Now, one thing we do know is that sometime between 1969 and 1974, vandals took the mantle from this room. Now, it's sad that it's gone, but it showed us some kind of interesting stuff. One of the things it shows us is some of the building techniques that went into constructing the mantles in this house, and it shows us evidence of John Drayton's original paint color. If you look just to the right and left, you'll see oh, yeah, a thin strip of that tan yellow ochre paint. That's the very first layer of paint that was ever applied to these walls. The third thing we can see is that there were two mantles in this room. Now there was John's original mantle, which followed this contour right here. You see the little cutouts there. And then Charles comes in in the 1780s. He starts making updates. He updates the style of the mantles. He puts another one in that follows this contour here. Mm. And then the Draytons come in in the 1880s and they paint that blue-gray paint. So that's one of the really neat things uh, that you can, you can learn a lot about houses when stuff like this is taken down, even though it's very sad that it's gone. So again, smaller space little bit plainer, but we still have egg and dart molding, and so that tells us we're still technically in a public space. This was most likely John Drayton's office. It would make a convenient office because we do have a door coming into this room from the portico, and so his foremen, his drivers, his overseers, people like that could come and go on business matters without bothering the rest of the household. Now again, in this room, we also see evidence of Charles Drayton's updates to the house. We have a <coughs> federal style mantle in this room. The federal style was popular in Charles Drayton's time. It's a little bit more conservative, a little more constrained than the big grandiose Georgian style. You can see a definite uh, a difference in these two architectural styles here. We also have what's called a Rumford firebox in this room. Um, Charles updated the fireboxes in the, in the house to this Rumford firebox style because this was better at pushing heated air out into the room and not losing it through the chimney. And what you'll find um, characteristic of a Rumford firebox is that it's very shallow, first of all. The side walls are opened up, usually at an angle, sometimes they're rounded. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and, um, and that helps radiate the heat out into the room. We know from Charles' diaries that he also had the enslaved homes here on the property outfitted with Rumford fireboxes as well, but you can, you can bet he's keeping meticulous track of how much that's costing him because at the end of the day, it's always a profit and loss scenario. Looking at how much he is making off of his enslaved labor force versus how much he's spending on the maintenance and the upkeep of that labor force. Now, 
Starting in 1884, the Drayton family starts measuring the heights of their children on the inside of this doorway. Feel free to take a closer look at that if you'd like to. Now, the sixth generation owner of Drayton Hall was a lady named Charlotta. She was here, well, she owned Drayton Hall from the 1920s up till about 1969, and she never had children, but she did have dogs, and so she measures her dogs on the opposite side of the door. I love it. <laughs> this is a great example of why preserving this house was the right approach. With historic homes, you can go one of two ways. You can restore it to a specific period of time, or you can preserve it as it is. You know, restoring the house would have been beautiful. We would have matched the correct paint colors, fresh paint on the walls, floor coverings, furniture, decorative arts, the whole nine yards. But we end up covering up all of that amazing yeah, family history. Is so it's too beautiful. It, it is. is. It is. I agree. Now, the thing is, and this is important, Charlotta Drayton was very involved in the preservation movement in downtown Charleston. You may or may not know that we were the first city in America to pass a historic preservation mm -hmm. law, so all of that beautiful architecture in downtown Charleston is protected. Mm -hmm. And Charlotta was a big part of that, and she practiced what she preached. She never modernized this house. No electricity, no plumbing ever installed in Drayton Hall. So we are standing in a home built in 1738 that is in near mint condition. All right, guys, we're just going to make a brief pit stop in this room, um, mainly to notice how plain it is compared to what we've seen so far. No egg and dart molding in here. That tells us that Charles Drayton was using this for more private purposes. In fact, this was his personal library. And so typically visitors wouldn't be coming into this space, and so they didn't need to go to the expense of making it real fancy. We can also see a different color scheme in this room. We've got um, more of a yellow ochre style with, with some burgundy highlights. This dates to the 1930s. This is Charlotta sprucing the house up a little bit. Ooh. She's only sprucing up this side, though, because they're not out here all the time. And when they are, they're just using a portion of the house, and it tends to be this side over here. So that's the only side that she spends money on, on sprucing up. And uh, she's kind of gone back to that original color that Don used, which is kind of neat. Now we're gonna head into the dining room next. So we're gonna go through here, a lot of interesting stuff to cover in there. So that's why I'm not spending too much time in this room. So, um, so we are in the dining room now, and we don't have any egg and dart molding around the ceiling, but we found evidence of gold gilding in the framed areas above the mantel, that's a really expensive decorative detail. So that tells us that when guests were here uh, dining with the family, they were certainly using this room, unless it was a real big group. And in that case, they could use the lower great hall as an even bigger dining space. Much like the drawing room, we've got another sham door over here. But in this case, we know that the Draytons took this one down sometime in the early 20th century so that they could put a bookcase here. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of really interesting things. We mentioned the people who built this house being largely enslaved. In this brick right here, there is a handprint, most likely from an enslaved child. Children, enslaved children, were put to work as, as early as six or seven, and one of the jobs they typically had was turning bricks as they lay to dry in the sun, and because those bricks are still kind of wet when they're being picked up, we have handprints and fingerprints left behind. We can also see this interesting diamond shape pattern. That's known as a diaper pattern. It's a type of decorative masonry meant to be seen on the outside of a building, so why is it here? Well, most likely an enslaved brick mason is practicing getting better at that pattern. He's doing it on a wall that's not going to be seen. At least he thought it's not going to be seen. And again, this is a really strong reminder of who built this house. And it also brings me to the staircase in the corner of the room. This is the service staircase. It's the only staircase in the entire home that goes all the way from the cellar below us up to the attic. It is a narrow winding staircase with no evidence of illumination from inside. So you can imagine with these door closed, um, how dark it was in this stairway. Very narrow winding staircase and everything about it is meant to keep the people using it out of sight. 
Now we know that it would take anywhere in the neighborhood of eight to 12 enslaved laborers to run this house on a daily basis. And just some of the enslaved laborers that we know about that were here in Charles's time were Dumplin, Mary, and Toby. Cooks down in the cellar, uh, cooking food for the family, bringing it up to this floor using this staircase. The enslaved nursemaid was a lady named Affie. She's taking care of the Drayton's children. The enslaved butler was a man named George. They had a uh, more or less what you might think of as a footman named Will. He would wait at table and he would also assist with food service. They had several chambermaids that were responsible for dusting and cleaning and emptying out chamber pots. They're all using this staircase. You can imagine how busy this was. And with no illumination inside, you're carrying what you need to do your job as well as a lantern or a candle or something to light your way as you navigate the stairs. Now, um, feel free to take a closer look at this. Um, I will tell you that the stairs that continue around and down to the cellar are missing. They were damaged by termites and we had to remove those. Any questions while we're here? All right, well, we're going to juxtapose this staircase with the grand staircase right out here. He is being inspired, and he's following in the footsteps of the grand homes of the English gentry. And, you know, especially if you're a fan of Downton Abbey, you know, that huge staircase they have in, uh, in their home. Well, this is what John's kind of going for here. He spends a fortune on mahogany for these stairs, and then he goes and paints it the most expensive color he could, which was vermilion red. Now that seems sacrilegious to us today, to paint mahogany red, but it was a statement of wealth and power. Not only did he have the money to spend on mahogany for his stairs, but he also had the money to paint it the most expensive color he possibly could. Now if we look up here at the uh, two steps where the brackets are missing, you can see some evidence of that red paint. And if we consider the original color for the walls, that vermilion red contrasted against the yellow ochre, what an impact that would make. And when you knocked on the front door of this house as a visitor, these doors here were closed. You had to be invited into this space. And if you were invited into this space, you're gonna do one of two things. You're going to continue out the back to visit the lovely parterre and uh, informal gardens behind the house, or you're gonna go upstairs to the ballroom to be entertained. And uh, we are gonna head upstairs next. All right, everyone, welcome to the fanciest room in the house. We've finally graduated to our Corinthian capital. We've got them all around us. We have some remnants of mahogany slabs above the windows and door here, and clearly the fanciest fireplace in the entire house. Now the crest above the fireplace here is not an official uh, crest. It's not registered in any book of heraldry. It is a design that the Drayton's came up with sometime in the 1880s, and they had painted on canvas and mounted over the fireplace here. But this is the room where the Drayton's entertained. They were famous for their concerts, their ballets, their dances, and it's probably all the activity and motion going on up here that damaged those first two ceilings in the, in the great <laughs> hall below us. They were having a party. Yeah, now up here, we have just a plain old pine board ceiling. Very plain. But the original ceiling, unfortunately, we don't know what it looked like, but it would have been a hand carved ceiling and without question, would have been the fanciest of the entire house. Now, again, the family was, was absent from the property from about 1860 until 1880. And in that 20 years, if you take into account the devastation of the Civil War and just neglect and time, a lot of things needed to be repaired. The roof leaked like crazy. The, most of the ceilings in the house were so badly damaged they needed to be replaced. Flooring needed to be replaced. And so the, the Drayton's used some of that phosphate money to make some very necessary repairs to the house, but in the post-Civil War years, they're not nearly as wealthy as they once were, so they're trying to save some pennies. And so up here on the second floor, as a cost-saving measure, they used pine wood uh, 
perhaps expecting later on to do something else up here, but they never did. And so we have a very plain ceiling up here today. The four rooms that exit off of this great hallway were bed chambers. We don't know who slept in which one, but we do know that the uses for these bed chambers could change depending on how the Drakens were using this upstairs space. If they're having a, a dance up here, for example, they're going to move furniture around or even out of these bed chambers so that they can be used as, as uh, drawing rooms so that people can rest after dancing. Uh, another one might be set up so that musicians can provide music for the event, things like that. So uh, that tells us that for the, for the Drayton's in the 1700s and 1800s, the, the uses for bedrooms was much more fluid than in modern day houses. You know, in our houses, a bedroom is always a bedroom, but not so in the 17 and 1800s. All right, y'all, so we're gonna head into the cellar from here. Please do watch your step. Some of these tiles are broken and they're a bit uneven. Okay, welcome to the kitchen. We've got a huge hearth right here in the center of the room. And again, this is where the enslaved cook staff, Dumplin, Mary, and Toby would be preparing meals to take up to the dining room. So while it's cool down here to us today, when this was a working kitchen and there were several fires going in this hearth, you can imagine how hot and smoky it got down here, even with the front and back doors for some cross ventilation, especially in the hot summer months, this would be an absolutely oppressive place to be working. And one of the bi biggest questions that we get from visitors is why the Drayton's did not have a separate kitchen away from the house and the biggest answer to that is that when John is designing Drayton Hall, he's following in the footsteps of the English gentry. Where were their kitchens? In the cellar of the home. So that's what John does here. It's later on, uh, after Drayton Hall is constructed, that the, that the colonists kind of catch on to how hot and humid it gets here in the summertime. They don't want the heat from those fires and the smells from the food and the smoke getting into their home, especially in the summertime. And so that's when they start detaching those kitchens. And that becomes common all the way up into the 1800s as well. But um, as far as we can uh, know from our archeological uh, surveys and, and study of Charles's uh, diaries, we, there was never uh, an external separate kitchen here on the property at any time. This was always the kitchen for the house. As with the floors upstairs, we've got four rooms that exit off of this big hallway here. The two over here on this side of the house do not have fireplaces. That tells us they were most likely used for storage. But the two over here do have fireplaces, and we're 99% sure that at least some of the enslaved staff working in this house were living, sleeping, and cooking in these two rooms. Now, if you were not sleeping down here in the cellar and you were working in the house, you might sleep in one of the passageways upstairs or even on the floor at the foot of someone's bed because you were on call 24 hours a day and the Drayton's wanted you in a convenient spot when they needed you. Now, I mentioned those columns that John Drayton took down here. Here are the remains of two of them. Uh, and the others are, like I said, on display in the visitor's center, fully, fully reconstructed. So you can see those if you go uh, visit the gallery there. And um, we're actually going to finish up in this small room right over here. Before I let you go, I do want to mention uh, just again about our Friends of Drayton Hall program. I, I told you how they helped us with the stabilization project. They are one of the biggest ways that we are able to continue doing the work that we do here. We are a nonprofit organization, so we do depend on fundraising. We would love to have you guys join us. If you are interested, you can grab a brochure from the rack there, uh, take it to the gift shop. They'll get you all set up with your membership. I um, don't know if we've got, oh yes we do. So grab a copy of Interiors while you're here. That's our, uh, that's our quarterly newsletter. It's something you'll receive as a member, and it's gonna keep you up to date on all of the new research that 
that we're learning out here and all the events and all kinds of cool stuff that are that is going on out here at Drake. But any lingering questions before I let you go? So thank y'all so much for coming out. Thank you. Go out this way. Thank you. Oh, what a great tour. The tour guide was really knowledgeable. This was fun to see this home finally after so long. And here's this little outbuilding. I'll show you inside here. 1791. This was built. Guessing that this was a smokehouse? No, this was, this was the bathroom. Yeah. The privy. Yeah, I forgot that a word for bathroom is privy. I guess that's what they used to call it that. This was a really great trip. I'm glad I came. South Carolina is beautiful. Drayton Hall is beautiful. The history of this place is pretty amazing and I'm just having a great time. It's time to hit the road though. Head back to Florida and back to work and all the stuff. Thanks for hanging out with me, friends, and I'll see you in the next video.